So I'm constantly surprised by the capacity of humans over the age of 40, like myself, to use technology to communicate better and to palliate some of the miseries of the current pandemic. Um, and so I've been delighted by the interest shown in the activities of the Franco-British Lawyers Society and the success of the webinars on public policy questions which um, we have been organizing. Uh, the next one of these is going to talk about justice online, uh, how, to, how the, courts are, the courts are coping with those challenges. Then there will be one on the subject of Ireland, where we have two senior judges and two academics who will be talking with great experience from difficult, from difficult and different uh, points of view. And then at the end of November, provisionally on the 25th, there's going to be one uh, on Brexit, where do we stand? And there I hope to have a former distinguished cabinet minister and a serving uh, minister and an academic uh, speaking. Uh, those dates will be confirmed in due course. Uh, today, we are um, going to continue to discuss a problem uh, for our countries presented by uh, Brexit. And as on previous occasions, I repeat, it's not our goal to rerun the referendum. It's not our goal to prevent the ship from sailing. It has sailed. Uh, the, uh, the issue, regardless of how we voted or didn't vote um, for Brexit, whether with an agreement or with no agreement, we want to examine the very many important uncertainties uh, which lawyers in practice, judges, officials, their clients, uh, political leaders uh, are having to confront. Now, during the last four years, I've given a bunch of speeches and I'm sure lots of you present have given speeches on the subject of the difficulties presented by Brexit. And uh, if you think of data protection, judicial cooperation, tariffs, technical standards, many, many subjects, uh, I used to say there are many reasons to fear uncertainty. But by contrast, I used to say in the field of competition and state aid, well, we've good reason to be optimistic. The UK has a well-respected competition agency, very tough uh, judicial review, convergence uh, on competition matters hugely with the institutions uh, of the European Union and close cooperation over the past 46 years, 47 years um, on, on Brexit questions. I know that the UK voice on the advisory committee on competition uh, matters, uh, which was an advisory is an advisory body of the European Commission's uh, Director General for Competition. The voice of the UK was always listened to with respect. And the UK in general was not in favor um, of picking national champions or subsidizing them. Now, where are we now? What might go wrong? Should we be worried that conflicts and disputes might arise, and I say extravagantly maybe, uh, echoing the tensions that we confronted in the 1980s over exorbitant US jurisdiction with respect to antitrust matters, when antitrust enforcement was a topic of hostile um, uh, relations between the two, uh, the several uh, jurisdictions. So um, that's the topic for today and our speakers are going to present the problems and maybe they're going to suggest some answers and I'll introduce them now so as not to slow things down. First of all we have uh, Thomas Tindemans. Uh, Thomas Tindemans 
inhaled politics in his cradle and for the past 30 years has been advising different people on where Europe is going uh, politically. And then uh, Peter Freeman, who's had a very distinguished, very varied uh, career in the field of competition as a well-respected expert practitioner uh, and then in a quasi-judicial capacity, uh, always in the field of competition. And then we've got Carol Zverev, our own Carol Zverev, I, I say, uh, who has been, I think, 15, 16 years as what in English would be called a judge in the French competition authority. And finally, Anneli Howard, uh, a graduate of the European Court, a former colleague of David Edward, and um, now a specialised barrister with excellent credentials in the field of competition and state aid. And then after discussion and questions, we'll have the pleasure of a summation from my mentor, master, friend, um, teacher, uh, Sir David Edward. So um, let's begin by hearing from Thomas Tindemans. Welcome, Thomas. Um, thank you, Ian. And uh, um, can I just say that it was always a pleasure working with you when we were colleagues, um, shaping European laws and uh, attacking nasty decisions by the European Commission, um, but always with great respect for the institutions. Uh, and that remains uh, memorable. Um, I would like to use my introduction to give you a bit of a political insight um, into where we stand. Um, I'll we'll leave the legal details to, to more expert speakers who come after me. Um, but if we can maybe show my first slide. Uh, let me just remind you where we are. Uh, so the United Kingdom invoked Article 50 of the treaty by letter. Uh, after that, a two-year period of negotiation on an orderly withdrawal agreement uh, started and was concluded. And also a political agreement on future relations was adopted. Uh, and so the United Kingdom left the European institutions um, by February of this year. Uh, however, it accepted to go through a transition period of one year in order to leave room for um, a negotiation on a future free trade relationship. And that uh, year is about to end on the 31st of December. Um, and we are now awaiting whether or not those negotiations will conclude indeed in a free trade agreement. Um, the expectations at the beginning of this Brexit saga were that it would unleash other forces that are opposed to the European Union as um, an integrating international legal entity um, and that more countries could follow the British example. However, uh, the contrary happened and never have the 27 member states been so unanimous in uh, refusing to seek the same path as the United Kingdom. At every summit, at every uh, ministerial gathering council meeting, um, the unity of the 27 with regards to the Brexit negotiations was confirmed explicitly and the mandate of the EU's negotiator, Mr. Barnier, who negotiates on behalf of the 27, was strongly supported. Um, this is rather remarkable because the impact of Brexit differs from one member state to another. And notably, uh, the North Sea countries, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, up to Spain and Portugal, um, are demonstrably harder hit by Brexit in economic terms, in trade terms, in, in transport terms, than, let's say, the more, the more easterly um, uh, European member states. But uh, nevertheless, United Europe worked. Can we go to the second slide then? 
And this is the famous staircase of Mr. Barnier, which still remains valid. Namely, um, if you have to negotiate a free trade agreement, the EU tends to look at precedents, what, uh, what exists. Excuse me, I heard. Um, the EU looks at what treaties it has on the shelf and whether it is feasible to pick one of those and adapt it to the situation. Uh, but the UK government's red lines, the successive uh, UK government's red lines, uh, limit the options. And um, we are now in a situation whereby um, either a free trade agreement based on what the EU has concluded with Canada, the CETA agreement, or with Korea, um, something of that nature could be feasible, or no deal, no agreement will be concluded. And that's quite important because um, the EU is very conscious of the fact that whatever free trade agreement it will conclude, that that will serve as a precedent for other negotiations coming thereafter. So um, that is a fundamental reason why the EU cannot accept a uh, bespoke, tailor-made, exceptional treaty with the UK, since um, other countries uh, in the world, uh, or indeed existing member states, could refer to that agreement to um, weaken the treaty obligations of the EU. And that is, if I may say, the fundamental flaw in the negotiations that are ongoing, that is the misunderstanding of how the EU cannot negotiate against its own treaty. It cannot offer market access at conditions to one country that it is not prepared to offer to other countries. Um, and that fear of creating a precedent has probably helped Mr. Barnier to stand very firm. On the EU side, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. On the EU side, there was, of course, preference for a very free uh, market for keeping the UK essentially within the customs union, union and the internal market if that were possible. Uh, even if the UK decided or opted not to take part in the legislative or policy uh, decision-making processes of the EU. Um, but that is no longer uh, on, the, on the charts and the, the UK claims to want a sort of Canada agreement. Um, although when we really look into the details, there is not that much similarity. Uh, but what is for the EU the absolute cornerstone of its own existence is what they call the integri integrity of the internal market. And what should we understand by integrity of the internal market? Essentially, it means that you can freely trade goods and services uh, and uh, within the territory of the 27 uh, member states um, if you respect the rules of that market and the rules that govern products and services uh, and if you accept that these rules can only be interpreted and judged by an independent European court that has the ultimate authority uh, over EU law. Uh, that contrasts with the UK position that claims we have left the EU to gain total sovereignty, uh, if that is something that can exist in an independent world, but we want to be able to set our own rules, uh, our own laws, and we don't want interference of foreign courts. This integrity of the internal market notion is particularly important for competition rules and state aids. Competition rules were inscribed in the treaties precisely to allow for uh, a level playing field competition uh, within that internal market, precisely to allow for the free movement of goods, capitals uh, and services. Um, and the competition rules have built on 
uh, many years of precedent created by notably the European uh, General Court and the European Court of Justice. Uh, these competition rules are now being revisited. Uh, the Commission has looked at whether it could find new tools to be able to intervene in market distortions, notably uh, by giant technological uh, developments and companies, uh, whether interim measures could be added to its toolbox to regulate markets. Um, and in the working program for 2021, uh, the Commission has uh, announced that it will look at potentially new market definition rules um, and uh, checking whether the, mer the current merger rules uh, are still the right approach to um, tackle the competition situation uh, in, the, in the continent for companies that in fact compete on a global scale. And this fits, of course, in the new policies that have been developed and that are being developed by the EU27 uh, and, and the new von der Leyen Commission, which include notably, for example, the reshoring of strategic industries, um, not, notably in light of what happened with the corona pandemic, uh, when we realized that for personal protection equipment or for essential medicines, ingredients, we were totally reliant on China. Uh, but it goes beyond just these uh, anecdotal elements. It is also a clearly new approach of what used to be called industrial policy. And industrial policy in the European tradition was always seen as the opposite of competition uh, law and competition policy. Uh, the assumption being that competition law can only apply to a functioning market and in the industrial policy is precisely trying to um, control that market or uh, direct it in certain, uh, uh, to certain goals. But these changes of competition rules are uh, announced and so we can see that post-Brexit and without an agreement on how to handle these changes that the ap applicable rules will rapidly vary between the United Kingdom and the continent. Um, and when we say variation of rules, there uh, inevitably we will get different decisions and different precedents uh, with potential conflict attached to it. A word on state aids, because that's another very important element of the integrity of the internal market. The ultimate test of whether a subsidy granted by a state is in conformity with the treaty rules lies in the fact of whether that uh, subsidy or that financial support distorts the internal market or not, gives an unfair advantage to certain players. And the EU has been adamant to um, enlarge the scope of its state aid scrutiny, uh, not just to leave it to the territory of the 27, but also to start looking at third countries, um, notably, for example, China, with a very important state-run economy and with companies that survive and compete um, thanks to massive public uh, funding. Um, so one can imagine that from an EU perspective, that level playing field on state aid should also apply to the UK if the UK wishes to um, enjoy the opportunity of a tariff-free access to the internal market uh, and wishes to compete, therefore, with products um, produced by manufacturers who are under state aid scrutiny if uh, they receive subsidies. So that's why this is not a light issue. It is the essence of the cornerstone of the European integration model, namely creating the free movement of goods, services, capital and people and do that under common rules and a common authority. That cornerstone, the integrity of the internal market is what uh, inspires the governments of the 27 to stay united.
Um, I would like to uh, show to, do, to mention here the paradox of this attitude at a moment in time when the EU prepares itself to inject the largest amount ever of public money into its own economy under the multi-annual financial framework that sets the EU budget for the next seven years and under the extraordinary 750 billion uh, next generation EU plan where the Commission will borrow money on international financial markets and redistribute that to tackle the fallout of this corona crisis and the economic damage this has done. So while at, on the one hand we are being quite strict on applying uh, the rules uh, on level playing field in with regards to state aids uh, for the internal market, uh, on the other hand we are looking at using subsidies or loans or other public money to revive the economy on a scale never met before. And to conclude my little introduction, I would like to say a word on what this um, process uh, does to the EU-UK uh, relations. We can maybe go quickly to the next slide. Um, I will not go into the details of this, but every step that has been examined by the negotiators on the uh, post-Brexit free trade agreement. Every step um, has consequences and we are now uh, at the last stage where either there will be no free trade agreement and we fall back to WTO uh, uh, trade relations, which is really the minimum and only covers goods and has a very little uh, um, impact on free trade in the sense that tariffs will apply, that customs controls will apply, um, and that restrictions will apply. Um, so, but if there is a free trade agreement, then there is maybe an opening to find new ways of working together for the future. And uh, allow me a prediction, and it's very dangerous to do so, but I think in the current political climate, especially if I may say so, in the internal discussions of the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, one cannot exclude at all this hard Brexit until the pain is felt, until the incidents become apparent, until the real world effect of a WTO relationship, WTO-based relationship, uh, uh, until that real pain is, is, comes home. And my prediction is that we will only see a real free trade agreement negotiation starting um, when the Brexit story is behind us, when the pain is felt and the economic uh, calamity uh, is, is confronted, and then um, adults will sit together uh, and say, how do we sort things out? But there are also uh, a few mistakes made in the course of this lengthy Brexit uh, negotiation history. Certainly on the uh, EU side, um, the, 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 the difference between the previous UK governments and the current one has probably not been properly assessed. Whereas um, the divisions in the Conservative Party and the divisions in the government coalition uh, under Mrs May uh, allowed the EU just to sit back and watch uh, drama unfold and uh, wait until the House of Commons found a majority to uh, agree on uh, uh, the withdrawal agreement or not. Uh, just as much as the, the EU is underestimating uh, the strong majority Mr. Johnson enjoys and uh, is still thinking, believing that somehow a division could be created within the party, within the membership of the parliament um, and hence this insistence on technical legal aspects to feed that division from the EU side. But politics being a dirty business, um, my prediction is that the majority that supposed Mr. Johnson will hold and therefore um, that, that the strategy of the EU to try and stick until the last minute to the hardest line um, will probably lead to no deal. The same can be said from the UK side. The UK uh, negotiators never properly understood 
what unanimity of 27 actually means and how strong the conviction of government leaders is to preserve the integrity of the internal market, even if that may cost a bit of business. Um, and that underestimation, plus the fact that the UK government never really understood that negotiators on behalf of the European Union cannot deviate from the treaty in what they put on the table to negotiate. That has never been properly understood. But beyond that, I think there is even more uh, damage done, uh, not only between the UK and the EU, but also between the individual member states and the UK. Um, the fact that so little uh, uh, concern, so little attention has been paid to what the effects of UK measures will be for the countries that are their neighbors and their partners. The fact that um, the, the economic damage that is happening um, uh, is sort of shrugged off as a price to pay for freedom. Um, that is not very helpful. Uh, I, I heard recently that young diplomats in the EU are now, uh, when they get their training, how to deal with uh, unwanted approaches by foreign diplomats or spies, that they now learn how to cope with uh, British representatives trying to get information out of them. And that sort of illustrates the real deep change in the relationship between countries. And I think that is regrettable, but inevitable in such a situation. And with that, I would like to stop. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, now, we might hear a little optimism from Peter Freeman, or we might not. Peter. Um, thank you very much. Um, Chairman, President. Um, yeah, I've been asked to talk about competition issues, but not to be too technical. Um, so I won't be giving you a clause by clause account of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 or the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act of 2020. Instead, I'll look at some main consequences for competition law in the UK from the UK's departure. And we must bear in mind that competition law is not a monolith. It consists of what's often called antitrust, that's restrictive agreements and abuse of dominance, merger control, and in the UK also the control of uncompetitive markets through the market investigation regime. And I'm not mentioning state aids because state aids is not part of UK competition law. It may become that, let us hope so, but not at the moment. Um, right, high level points. First of all, some history. Uh, back in the old days, the UK had some law called Restrictive Trade Practices Law and Monopolies Law. Uh, in the 1967 white paper on the legal and constitutional implications of UK membership of the European communities, HMSO 1 and 9 pence cost, it was pointed out that the EC, or EEC as it was then, also operated in the field of monopolies and restrictive practices, quaint terminology, and it observed that that law, after membership, would have direct internal effect in the UK. And the analogy was with um, United Kingdom law, restrictive trade practices law, applying to that foreign country, Scotland. I thought the president would like that. <coughs> Now, an early example, indeed, of EC competition law being applied in the UK, which, which our president will also be familiar, was the dispute over trading terms for Scotch whisky manufactured by the Distillers Company. Parallel exports of Johnny Walker Red Label led to a case in the European Court in 1980. But even before the UK had joined the communities, as they were, uh, European competition law could affect UK companies through the so-called effects doctrine. And the most famous example of this was the Dye Stuffs case in the uh, early 1970s, late 60s, early 70s, uh, when ICI was fined as a cartel participant, even though it was headquartered outside the UK. I have a feeling we may be heading for more of such cases. But just continuing the history lesson briefly, from 1998 to 2002, there was a fundamental reform to UK competition law 
creating the Competition Act, chapters one and chapter two, which were clones of the EU antitrust law. Although I did note that one official at the time tried to claim that this was a spontaneous reform and that being harmonized with EU law would just be another advantage. You can make of that what you want. Those reforms also recast the monopolies law as a new competition-based markets regime, the markets investigation regime or MIR, that was intended to operate alongside antitrust law and to support them. Then of course in 2003 we had the modernization regulation where the UK like other national authorities was expressly empowered and indeed obliged to apply EU law to competition situations that affected uh, trade between member states. Um, that meant that in the future most cases done by the UK authority which was the Office of Fair Trading in those days uh, were done in parallel so under UK and EU law. The OFT became a member of the European Competition Network and all was happy and well in the world. Uh, leaving the EU, I'm afraid, will remove this direct internal legal effect and negate the express enforcement power and duty conferred by the Modernisation Regulation. The successor to the OFT, which is the Competition and Markets Authority, will cease to be a member of the ECN and the various collective arrangements for exchange of information and cooperation will cease to apply to the UK. The UK competition regime is quite simply no longer part of the EU regime. But in practice we may expect to see a high degree of cooperation with informal arrangements or particular arrangements replacing these structures. This is partly because old cooperative habits die hard but also because it's in both sides interest to maintain the closest possible links. I'll come back to that. Now on the matter of doctrine, there's been little or no separate UK competition law during this period, at least in the antitrust field. For UK authorities and courts, in particular my own tribunal, the Competition Appeal Tribunal, EU jurisprudence and doctrine have been central to the competition cases, whether it's United Brands in relation to excessive prices or Intel in relation to exclusionary practices. Now recently, with the whiff of Brexit in the air, things have changed. The outgoing chair of the CMA, Lord Tyree, has proposed a radical rebooting of UK competition law to make it, quote, fit for the digital age, whatever that means. A central proposal has been to place an overriding duty on the UK authorities and courts to protect the interests of consumers rather than promoting competition. It's hard to see how that could be actually be enacted if the UK was still part of the EU competition framework. Now the government has not so far reacted to these proposals, uh, but there is now a high level review of the UK competition regime being conducted by John Penrose MP, who is a leading backbencher. And this is due to report by Christmas. It's not known what Mr Penrose will recommend, but the siren calls for rebooting uh, remain. So the question really is whether the future will be one of substantive UK divergence from EU law or broad conformity. conformity. So let's look at the individual topics briefly. Antitrust. Assuming chapters one and two of the Competition Act are retained and not repealed, and there's no reason to suppose they won't be, the question is how are they to be interpreted? The government's intention is apparently to preserve existing EU competition law as a sort of precedent bank to avoid what it calls a vacuum in interpretation, lovely, lovely thought, but to allow a degree of flexibility. Now, I won't go into detail, but the Competition Act provisions appear to be within the terminology of the 2018 statute, EU-derived domestic legislation falling within the overall category of retained EU law. Um, so some deviation is, is needed according to the government, to avoid the danger of ossification of doctrine. Again, a lovely concept. Uh, there is a power in the 2020 Act for a minister to allow courts to deviate, but there's also a proposal to replace the current section 60 of the Competition Act, which requires effective consistency, uh, with something that allows divergence in relation to future EU case law and some divergence from existing case law in quote appropriate cases. 
final word on top rotation will rest, rest with the UK Supreme Court, which is not bound by retained EU law. So the conclusion I draw from this is that it's clear that the UK means to give itself the legal power to develop its antitrust law differently from that of the EU. Now the question is, would it be wise to do so? Arguments for divergence rest in part on the point that if the UK is no longer part of the EU, it doesn't have to take account of the EU's market unification objective. So people say it could consider the anti-competitive effect of export bans on their economic merit rather than as a matter of religion. However, economic policy may develop differently, as Thomas has said. Um, the UK may want to find a way of applying antitrust law to the big tech sector more flexibly than the Chapter 2, Article 102, Abuse of Dominance Framework. Or, given some of the recent statements, it may want to encourage monopolization in some sectors for reasons of COVID-19 recovery. Who knows? Clearly, the need to settle these questions at EU level is no longer a hindrance. But is it wise? Isn't there a severe danger that this kind of exceptionalism simply risks making UK competition law fascinating but decreasingly relevant? Wouldn't it be wiser to proceed by agreement with our close neighbours? Uh, most of the moves the UK is toying with will only work if agreed internationally in any case. And that seems to contrast with an aggressively insular competition policy. So while I fear for the worst, uh, I hope for the best. I expect to see a lot of political rhetoric emphasising that the UK is no longer subject to foreign rule, but a high degree of practical cooperation and conformity. Markets and monopolies. Next topic. Well, the competition test in the market investigation regime, which is market features that prevent, restrict or distort competition, is remarkably similar to Article 101. Uh, remedy measures, including divestment of assets or undertakings, um, can be taken by the authority and it is a very powerful instrument. When I was chairman of the Competition Commission, which used to apply the markets investigation regime, I spent much time explaining this to my EU colleagues some of whom, not all, I have to say, were impressed. But it is remarkable that the new competition tool now being discussed at EU level has considerable similarities to the UK's market investigation regime. The key point being that, unlike uh, sector inquiries, the power to enact remedies is baked into the system. Now, there was a theoretical danger of um, uh, inconsistency between MIR remedies and antitrust law under the uh, Brexit, pre-Brexit regime. That has now gone, that risk has gone. So you would expect the UK to make greater use of the market investigation regime, particularly in relation to the big tech sector. As yet, there's no sign of this, but it's no, worth noting that Lord Tyree's proposals included one to broaden market investigations into a general market intervention tool and not exclusively based on competition. I can only say that proposal carries risks as well as benefits as it separates the market investigation from mainstream competition. So that's the markets topic. Mergers. Now in the UK, um, public interest based merger control, which was the old fashioned system since 1965, was gradually replaced in the years up to 2002 by an economics-based SLC, Substantial Lessening of Competition Regime, which was applied jointly by the OFT and by the Competition Commission. And interestingly, there was at the same time pressure that led to the EU moving to a, a slightly similarly based substantive test, substantial impediment to effective competition. Now the great benefit for the UK from the European merger control was the one-stop shop. Separate notification to the UK was not required. This had the effect for the UK authorities that their merger control work was mainly directed to smaller scale mergers, as few major mergers are purely national in effect. Uh, and there were also differences in detail from in the UK regime. The main effect of Brexit will be to increase substantially the workload for industry, both for industry and for the CMA itself. CMA is estimating it will have to deal with 50 or 60 extra cases a year, and these will not be small cases. And we should just note that there is a current debate in the UK 
I, I noticed Thomas referred to the debate in the EU about changing merger control for companies that compete on world markets. Uh, in the UK, there is a debate about whether merger control should be more expressly based on wider public interest considerations rather than just competition. It's an interesting debate. Uh, I don't believe it'll go anywhere. But it's a pity that these two debates, EU and UK, have now to take place separately. Uh, they are a further uh, pressure for possible divergence. And it's just worth noting also that recently the CMA has floated the idea of having a separate and parallel merger control regime for big tech mergers, requiring, amongst other things, mandatory pre-notification. Now, while this is a recognition that current powers are inadequate, uh, it's not clear that the UK can achieve very much in relation to big tech mergers on its own. So again, I suspect that while the rhetoric will remain, in practice, there will be much more cooperation. Let us hope so. Now the fourth area, shall I continue? The fourth area, very quickly, private enforcement. I'm not gonna say very much about this because I know Anne Melly will be covering it. Um, there are two things to note here. First of all, in relation to follow-on damages actions, uh, decisions of the European Commission will no longer have binding effect in the UK, so they will not in themselves ground a follow-on damages actions. Now, you can still admit these as foreign law, but it's not the same animal at all. And then secondly, the arrangements for recognition and, re and enforcement of UK judgments uh, uh, within the EU context will fall away and replacements will have to be found. The net effect of all this will mean, in my view, that the attractiveness of the UK as a forum for actions on the basis of EU infringement findings will diminish and possibly very substantially diminish. And one of the problems, of course, is that the number of domestic infringement decisions, which could give rise to private actions, has been very modest. Now, while this may paradoxically have encouraged the growth of private infringement, it is very difficult for a plaintiff or a group of plaintiffs to establish infringement in complex cases. An authority is much better placed to find and prove illegal activity. And it remains to be seen whether the CMA and the sectoral regulators can provide the necessary diet of decisions for future private litigation. Now, I'm not going to say anything about state aids. As I said, um, that is the subject of negotiation. It is a vexed topic. Um, state aids in the UK is regarded as something European and uh, we wait to see what is what is produced in its place. Now to conclude, if I may, um, in my view sanity has not prevailed as yet. Had the proposals for a future UK-EU relationship which were going the rounds under the May government remained in play, it would have been boss possible to take a modestly optimistic view, as I think president alluded to at the beginning, that good sense would prevail and the UK would settle into an arrangement under which its competition law would remain substantially aligned with the EU and there would be formal arrangements for close mutual cooperation. As it is, not only have these arrangements been substantially weakened in themselves by the modified withdrawal agreement from January this year, but we are now faced with the very real prospect, as Thomas said, of no agreed future trading framework at all. Now, I suppose my thesis is that the apparent independence that this situation confers on the UK is entirely illusory. And in practice, UK law will have to remain aligned with EU competition law if it wishes to be effective. Trying to construct a wholly new UK competition system, perhaps based on the market investigation framework, broadened out to include other factors, perhaps combined with a public interest based merger control system, to my mind, that is an error of major proportions. The consequence would that it would, it would risk the UK being regarded as a, an outlier regime and rather an unimportant one at that. On that cheerful note, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Peter, uh, thank you very much for the history and the sober appraisal. Thank you. And now it's uh, we turn to France and Carol Zwerreth. Carol, can you unmute and welcome? Thank you very much. 
Well, thank thank you indeed uh, to the British uh, Franco British Lawyers uh, Society for inviting me to take part in this uh, this webinar from the uh, make a presentation from the French uh, perspective, uh, which I am going to try and make as uh, as practical uh, as possible and uh, as short as possible as time marches on. Um, in addition to uh, the, the honour I have of serving on the French uh, Committee of the Society, I was uh, also an independent uh, member and judge at the French uh, Competition Authority, which was entitled the Conseil de la Concurrence when I was appointed in 2006, and which then became the Autorité de la Concurrence uh, in 2009, um, and my term of appointment uh, uh, with the authority came to an end in, in March uh, 2019. Uh, so of course I want to make it clear uh, that I'm making this presentation uh, solely in my own personal capacity, expressing my views, and that of course I'm neither authorised uh, nor intend to make any statement or give any opinion that could be interpreted as representing the views of the authority or for that matter on behalf of any other entity or body that I might also be associated with. Well, Brexit, um, what sadness. As we've heard, it of course uh, remains to be seen uh, whether uh, a UK, uh, EU uh, agreement, trade agreement can be successfully negotiated before the, uh, the transition period ends on the 31st of December. And if so, uh, what its terms will be. We've heard rather more pessimism than optimism about something happening. And I have to say that from what I've read in the press, over the weekend and the recent days, we don't appear to have made a great deal of progress on the three outstanding major topics, fishing, governance and competition. And of course, we've gone by the, uh, the sell-by date uh, that Mr Johnson uh, set. Uh, the topic of, uh, of competition, which is obviously the only theme of our webinar this morning, has uh, substantial issues, uh, subjects to get our minds around from my perspective. Um, which are, as we've already heard, state aid and the increased relevance of UK anti-competitive behaviour rules and merger control, not only post-Brexit, but also as of now. And I'd like to concentrate on that and, like Peter, not really refer to anything much about uh, state aid. Now, because time and tide uh, wait for no man, not even for women, uh, companies are having to hone their strategies for submitting international deals in the coming days and weeks, and in particular deals uh, which were previously only notified at uh, European Union level. Um, I'd just also like to add uh, that as a general principle in the context of competition rules, in the majority of cases, uh, Brexit and its impact is not really a French topic. Um, uh, although I'm presenting the French perspective, it is rather an EU one. One could, of course, say, well, there could be uh, questions or concerns that could be raised about uh, how the national competition authorities will be able to cooperate going forward. Um, on that side, I would say that to date, the relationship between the Autorité de la Concurrence and its UK uh, counterpart has been excellent, with ongoing and multiple exchanges at varying levels um, of the two bodies. And there's no reason, from what I can see, why, from a people perspective, uh, that should change. We've heard, and I confirm, that there's been institutionalised exchanges uh, within the ICN and the ECN, or the HEC, as the French call it, the Réseau Européen de la Concurrence, as well as bilaterally uh, on international cases requiring merger control authorization, or indeed investigations into uh, restrictive practices. And I'm sure that both the CMA and the Autorité de la Concurrence will do their uh, utmost to continue down those uh, same lines, particularly as the um, interim CMA chair, uh, Jonathan Scott, was already a senior independent member of the CMA board. And the Autorité's chair, uh, Isabel de Silva, has a very international uh, outlook and background. However, it remains to be seen uh, what the ultimate terms of the Brexit withdrawal agreement and in particular what the competition aspects will look like um, and whether the CMA will be invited to ECN meetings, for example, as a guest star for an interim or medium term uh, period, whether friction will arise over the years, for example, as a result of the possible uh, UK approach to state aid, 
and whether that sort of thing or, or other events uh, could put friction uh, into what is a very fluid and well-oiled relationship at this point in time. I very much hope not, and I believe that the authority is also very anxious to maintain that good uh, working relationship. On another side, uh, one also cannot exclude from a more global uh, perspective that there could be bilateral fallout effects and friction arising, for example, from the impact of state aid on competing companies and their ecosystems in France and the UK, uh, or that there could also be an, on, uh, an impact on France's ability or attractiveness, as the French like to put it, activity, to attract inward investment uh, if third party investing companies could benefit from an unlevel playing field on different sides of the channel. One could think about examples such as events reducing or abandoning environmental legislation or providing government grants or indirect aid. All of that remains to be seen. A further indirect consequence could be around the topic and effects of foreign direct investment uh, legislation. As you may be aware, uh, France recently enacted changes to its FDI legislation involving increased security. And it remains to be seen if there will be a similar vision on that topic between the two countries in the years to come and what the impact of state aid on the respective FDI approaches could be. So coming back to the French perspective of what could happen around merger control, competitive practices, whilst, uh, as I've already said, this is not really a French, but it, uh, rather a EU issue, I'm going to take a couple of uh, topics and I won't reiterate, obviously, what more eminent speakers have already uh, set out about the contents of UK rules, but just give a quick head, heads up about the concerns going forward. If we look at merger control to begin with, um, French, and indeed it could well be the case for another uh, European country, French companies making or being involved in acquisitions in the UK, in the UK will need to look into planning during the current countdown and work out whether they should get their deals into the CMA now or rather wait before getting too far down the line and risk uh, having their deal uh, held up because of the subsequent constraints that the CMA could oppose. As a reminder, as of the 1st of January, as we've already heard, the CMA will gain jurisdiction over mergers that had been previously reviewed at the EU level under the exclusive jurisdiction of the, uh, of the EC. So companies could well be saying, well, should I move or should I stall uh, on my deal during the approximately 75 days uh, to come? Uh, and that's a tough question to, to answer, not only because uh, each acquisition is a fact-based case, but also because there will be greater exposure to UK merger control than, uh, than previously. Whilst, as we know, UK merger control is voluntary, uh, in practice, there's not inconsequential risks if a merger raising a potential competition issue is not notified. And that is because, also, as we've already heard, not only historically the reach of UK merger control has been broad, the clearance process lengthy and indeed onerous compared to other uh, countries, uh, including uh, not just on the financial level, but on the ability to, to issue hold separate uh, orders. But also, as I understand it, the CMA is adopting an increasingly tough approach and with Brexit in sight has been granted the financial means and the human resources to do so, including gathering market intelligence, to look a little bit more under the radar with regard to the decision, uh, because it is a voluntary decision, not to notify. All that to say that the merging uh, parties and their advisors will need to consider whether, based on the particular facts of their operation, it makes sense to volunteer a CMA filing now, and not just for acquisitions of control, but also in the case of minority uh, deals. And in this M&A sprint towards the end of the year, or in fact rather towards the 23rd of December, in this case it probably won't be handled during the, uh, the Christmas uh, period, uh, companies will need to weigh up how best to handle their filing uh, tactics and the strategy for filing must be thoroughly thought out. 
And that's not easy in these times of flux with an imprecise knowledge of the interaction and the rules and what is likely to, uh, to lie ahead. So normally EU law will apply until the 31st of December uh, because as we have also heard, uh, Brexit has happened. We are in the withdrawal period. And thereafter, transnational cases will have to be filed in both the EU and in the UK for French companies and for others. However, it would not be the case that if a deal is filed with the EU before the 31st of December, then it will solely be a EU phase one or phase two. The UK will be able to take uh, jurisdiction, even if pre-notification discussions have started, as of now with the EU. And so once again, companies will need to work out as of now, that when filing, how these possible dual filing requirements will impact the flow of the operation. One-stop shopping will no longer be a foregone uh, conclusion that companies should integrate. Uh, as of now, uh, the CMA, whose role should be taken seriously and who has appetite to look at deals. From what I hear, apparently 40% of phase one deals are now going to phase two, and that will result uh, in a significant increase in budgets for filing. In addition, the duration of an investigation uh, is also likely to increase. And that's bad news for business, uh, whichever nationality, uh, because one obviously likes to get into uh, the thick of things and, uh, and deal with the integration of a topic. Um, and there's going to be an awful lot of need for coordination. So foreign investors, in this case the French uh, investors, will nearly, clearly need to take all of this into consideration as well. As many complex deals are currently being done in these COVID times, because unfortunately uh, multiple restructurations are ensuing as a result of the very difficult economic uh, climate, and that can be opportunities for, for some people, um, and people are acting quickly on the ability to take a, a stake in a company or to acquire them. Once again, the companies now need to work out where is the center of gravity of their deal, as well as how to minimize the filing bureaucracy and costs at a time when people want to act quickly because of this restructuring environment. So there's going to need to be um, some creative thinking, let's say, about share of supply under the CMA voluntary filing, in particular if an acquisition is in a hot space, as we like to say, such as life sciences or, or tech and then decide on the right time to close the deal and chose the most efficient uh, regulatory uh, route. On the topic of anti-competitive uh, behaviour, so cartels and abuse of uh, dominant positions, um, the CMA will have uh, jurisdiction to investigate anti-competitive behaviour that impacts the UK, whereas before it was precluded from investigating an infringement already under investigation at the EU level. So going forward once again, uh, foreign companies um, and their advisors will uh, have to comply with both the EU and the CMA with the same concerns and consequences on uh, flow and coordination, as I discussed earlier about merger control on international business. That is to say that potentially uh, French companies could become subject to parallel EU antitrust and CMA proceedings in respect of behaviour that impact both the UK and EU operations. Where the EU has formally initiated proceedings before the end of the transition period, the CMA cannot investigate uh, the same infringement. However, if between now and the end of the year no EU in proceedings are initiated by that time, then the CMA will have jurisdiction to investigate any conduct that affects the UK, whether the conduct occurred before uh, or after the 31st of December. That being said, the potential defendants should note that where immunity or leniency has been obtained with one foreign regulator, France, EU or other European entities, the CMA will not recognise the credit obtained uh, from that uh, entity if it decides, uh, if the CMA decides to, to initiate uh, parallel proceedings. So this is just a very uh, quick highlight into the complexity and the questions that companies need to be uh, putting. Uh, so 
the run up to the end of the year should be a time when preemptive action with the CMA could be useful, in my opinion, from an organisational efficiency uh, standpoint. Of course, and uh, in guise of conclusion, both on the topic of anti competitive behaviour and more generally, uh, because I'll stop here as time is running on, as I said. Uh, one could also find that it could be better to avoid any infringement likely to provide grounds for an investigation, whereas of course on the M&A side giving rise to merger control is a much less foolhardy uh, course of action. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now um, back to England uh, and uh, Maître Howard, nice to have you with us. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak with such preeminent speakers. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the practicalities from the practitioner's point of view of the impact of Brexit on mainly antitrust and private enforcement. And I know Mia has got some slides to show for you. Um, given the time constraints, I'm going to whip through these quite quickly. Um, so there will be some takeaways that you can take with you. I'm not going to speak to them, but I want to cover the general themes. If we could go to slide two very quickly. This, uh, this presents the Article 50 timeline, which I've, I've rewritten several times since 2016. Um, and now we're approaching further and further close to, to what I call the drop dead date of the 31st of December. We're still perilously close to the two options, whether we do have an FTO or whether we go through the WTO. But it's, it's common that under both routes, there will need to be some form of competition law and state aid anti-subsidies regime, even under the WTO. So that is the initial framework. Mia, if we just pull to the next slide. Um, what I want to do now is just really set out initially what the legal landscape is going to look like after Brexit. And I thought if we start with Northern Ireland first, that should be the easy uh, terrain to navigate because it's a case of plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. What the protocol provides is obviously the EU competition law and state aid law is going to remain the same for Northern Ireland. So there will still be direct effect. EU provisions, both existing EU and future EU decisions and legislation will have the same legal effect within Northern Ireland as it does within the rest of the EU. And EU concepts will be continued to be interpreted and applied in conformity with any EU case law. And there is no time limit to, to those provisions. So the, the UK courts in relation to Northern Ireland will be um, bound by future EU developments indefinitely. And it's that late realization which has led to the Internal Markets Bill with sections 45 and 47, which are going to give the UK, in the event of a no deal scenario, uh, the freedom to disapply certain provisions of the protocol. Now that's passing a, a very rocky passage through the House of Commons and the House of Lords. It was rejected by the House of Lords not last night. So it remains to be seen whether that bill will ever actually get passed, but it's clear that there will have to be substantial amendments if, if it is going to be. So the, the Northern Ireland situation is not as, as clear as, as we thought it was going to be and is still under review. Mia, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, in terms of the rest of England, Wales and Scotland for the moment, the, um, the position on the legal terrain is that there is effectively a watershed so that anything that is EU rela uh, related legislation or cases up until the 31st of December, sorry that should say, um, uh, of this year will be cut and pasted into our domestic statute book. So what I've tried to do here is just to give you a snapshot of um, the provisions that will be carried across and replicated. Obviously, Article 101 and 102 will, will be carried across, as will the concepts of services of general economic interest and the state aid regimes under 107 and 108. They will apply insofar as they affect the United Kingdom. All regulations, which include the modernisation regulations, but also the merger regulations and the block exemption regulations will also be carried across and will be given effect as sort of parallel exemptions under UK competition law. Infringement decisions up and until the 31st of December will also be carried across and be binding, as will any commission regulations and guidance. 
but interestingly, rights from directives will not be automatically carried across. And that's because they've presumed to have already been implemented by the UK. And then there are additional carve outs that will not be carried, such as the fundamental charter of rights, the fundamental principles of EU law, including effectiveness and proportionality, and obviously the doctrine of supremacy. Mia, if we could have the next slide. So what, what does this watershed mean in, in terms of both public and private enforcement? It means that actually anything that is actually in force and operative on the 31st of December this year will be carried across, but future EU developments will not. And we can see immediately that there is going to be a chasm between UK competition law and EU law because there are a number of developments in the pipeline under EU competition law that we will see will be adopted or will come into force after the end of the transition period. So there are the proposals at the moment for the ECN plus arrangements. There, the vertical block exemption is also under review. There were obviously going to be continuingly pre preliminary references to the Court of Justice, particularly on the damages directive, where the Court of Justice will give a, a, a ruling that's uniform for the EU 27, but that will not be binding um, on the UK. The Withdrawal Act in the UK provides that courts may have regard to anything that is adopted by the courts or another EU entity. That's so far as the court considered it, considers it relevant and there's no, obviously no obligation to, to follow that. So that in itself introduces an element of uncertainty um, for claimants that might be choosing where to launch their private actions and knowing whether the courts are going to follow EU law or not. And it also raises the prospect of appeals whether to the Court of Appeal or onto the Supreme Court. There's also uncertainty about what is known as in-flight provisions. Those are those that are, have already been adopted, but have not yet been transposed. So they're in force. For example, the collective redress mechanism may, may be in force, but is not being transposed until after transition. Uh, and it waits to, to see what weight will be given by national courts to those provisions going forward. Mia, if I can move to the next slide. So the, the, there is a transitional regime. So at the moment, the CMA can investigate in parallel with the Commission where there is an effect on trade. And, um, and it will be applying Article 101 and 102 to existing conduct where it can prove this, there's such an effect. But after transition ends, then they will only investigate under the UK competition law regime. But obviously UK companies can still be investigated, uh, as Peter Freeman has explained, after transition where there is an effect on the EU. So really companies in the UK face the prospect of a double regulatory burden. This is another one of the Brexit ironies that was meant to reduce red tape and, uh, and regulatory intervention. It does mean that UK companies face a double, a double um, investigation burden, a double costs, double uncertainty and double fines um, by both the UK and the EU authorities. It's not clear what is the scope of damages claims that can be brought. Again, there is a transitional regime. So for any conduct that takes place prior to December, the 31st of December this year, the courts can continue for a period of, of six years, limitation period, to have claims brought on the basis of Article 101 and 102. Uh, that's set out in Schedule 8 of the Act. But it's not quite clear what the, the, the reach of that jurisdiction is going to be. Is that only insofar as damages have been suffered in the UK? Or will there also be this international um, jurisdiction, particularly under, um, under UK private international rules to bring in uh, damp loss from other, other jurisdictions, including loss that may have been suffered in other EU, EU states on the basis that the UK is the most appropriate forum to determine those. Mia, if I could have the next slide, please. So what happens to damages actions after the end of the transition period? It's clear that Article 102 will be carried across, but will become part of our domestic statute law and therefore will only have a domestic reach. But claims will still be able to plead 
whether it's EU law in its own right, or whether it's um, uh, the member law of a member state as foreign law. Now, that is not uh, an easy or straightforward thing to do because the courts, again, treat that as an issue of fact. They may have an expert um, foreign lawyer to explain how the law um, applies, but at the end of the day, the, tr the, the judge forms uh, his or her own view as a question of fact. The courts will continue to interpret EU law that's been issued or adopted prior to the end of December in a purposive manner, uh, along with the lines of ordinary EU construction. But that is unless and until it's modified by Parliament or through statutory delegated legislation. And there has been a recent consultation on the scope of the courts to depart from existing of, um, EU rulings. And on Friday last week, the consultation concluded and draft regulations have been put forward, which will give the Court of Appeal, as well as the Supreme Court, the power to disregard um, Court of Justice rulings and commission decisions. Now that has been adopted on the basis that it's necessary to stop the fossilization of EU law within the domestic statute book and to give the courts maximum flexibility to facilitate the um, the UK's own competition law policy but we can see that it's going to that is alone is going to create further legal uncertainty it could even give rise to a situation where the court of appeal can overrule case law from the supreme court because the previous supreme court ruling was based on a on a court of justice um, decision there is also uncertainty because obviously the Commission will continue to hand down decisions. Parties will want to rely on those, if not as a follow on, as a binding decision, they'll certainly want to sort of read across from any findings from the European Commission into their domestic claim. But what weight will national courts give to those decisions and findings? At the moment, they've, uh, it's been confirmed, you know, that existing decisions are binding, but future decisions will have to be a matter of argument and commission decisions will rank probably no higher than, for example, jurisprudence from the US or from Australia or from other jurisdictions. There will be no duty on national courts to suspend private litigation pending commission investigations or subsequent appeals. Again, there's no duty of sincere cooperation. So there will be a debate as to whether UK proceedings can continue afoot, even though the findings of the commission may be still subject to to appeal and of course there will be no um, preliminary references so the, the national courts are going to have to resolve these issues for themselves obviously the UK courts have very specialist competition um, courts but we can expect um, uh, appeals probably up to the Supreme Court lastly we have the jurisdiction applicable law the uk has not asked to, re to retain the benefit of the recast brussels regulation or the rome one regulation so we will not have the comfort of the jurisdiction provisions or the recognition and enforcement provisions it looks like the uk will not be able to accede to the lugano convention and may have to fall back on the hague convention on choice of law so again that is going to create uncertainties about forum, uncertainties about enforcement. And even if the parties try to mitigate those risks by including choice of law clauses or jurisdiction clauses in favour of the UK courts, for example, those can still be overridden because the, particularly in the EU, the RBR and the Rome um, provisions will apply order publique and they will override the party's choice in where there is exclusive jurisdiction or there are mandatory rules such as competition law. So that is creating, going to create a race, I think, for competition law claims across the EU, whether parties want to face the uncertainty in the UK, whether funders are prepared to tolerate that uncertainty and risk, or whether they would rather launch their claims in European jurisdictions instead. And we can already see that large international firms like Hausfeld are already establishing branches in Brussels and the Netherlands and, and seeing those as attractive forums. It will be um, a debate as to whether claims will be able to con be consolidated before one court or whether there's going to have to be separate proceedings for the UK and for the EU. 
And again, there will be risks and de uh, debates about whether, like the Italian torpedo, English claims can be used as a, a kind of rocket to try and stop proceedings in other jurisdictions and, and be the court first seized. So we're entering to this terrain of considerable legal uncertainty. It's hard to predict what the impact is going to be for private enforcement. Um, but for, for, the, for, for lawyers in particular, there's going to be a lot of challenging issues and a lot of appeals, I would suspect. So I'll stop there because of time and we can raise some of these questions in the debate. Thank you. M many, many thanks. Um, these have been four really uh, precious and perceptive um, interventions. I'm, I'm extremely grateful. Um, the questions have been flowing and um, one to uh, um, Anneli. Um, explain to us more slowly, please, um, why Rome 1 and Rome 2 or Lugano uh, won't apply or are unavailable. I think they, they probably could have been available, but the UK has not asked for them to be included in the negotiations. Um, and I, kn I know there have been considerable debates where several lawyers have been trying to explain to the Ministry of Justice and the UK negotiators the importance of having these included in the negotiations, but they've not been taken forward as a matter of priority. Um, there is a block on the UK acceding to the Lugano Convention. I don't know whether that's a negotiating stance by the EU, whether they're trying to hold that up in order to gain um, negotiating leverage in another area, but at the moment everyone is assuming on the presumption that the UK will not be allowed to join the Lugano Convention, which, which Sorry. So that might be um, Thomas's theory was uh, once the floods are rising and people are retiring to the third floor of the building to avoid drowning, um, they may um, they, they may initiate remedial measures to palliate the adverse effects, and so. Um, such international conventions, judicial cooperation, all those things which are immensely important, Trevi and, and so on, uh, those matters, even if as of January 1 there's no cooperation, that doesn't mean there'd be no cooperation forever. No, this brings the deal whether, whether there is going to be a prospect of what is referred to as mini deals whether the yeah. UK will be allowed to enter into targeted uh, agreements, whether on a bilateral or, or with the whole of the EU 27 on particular aspects. Yeah. Um, and that, that okay. may be a possibility. There's Thank also you. obviously the Hague Convention, which you don't have to be an EU member state to join. And that, that covers, I think, 41 different states around the world. The UK has never joined that before, but, but that is the, the back. And that's, that closely mirrors some of the provisions in the Brussels regulation. Um, a question to, um, I guess it's Peter really, um, given all that we know about and given what we've been discussing this morning, is would you have a prediction as to whether the UK, uh, I'm now talking competition authorities, would they be looking for um, bilateral understandings with the Bundeskartellamt and the Autorité and so on? Um, or would they talk to the, um, uh, to the mad dogs in DG competition in Brussels? Well, um, I should just say, like Carol, I, I have been speaking in a personal capacity and I continue to do so. We um, didn't doubt it and we <laughs> encourage it. No. Um, I certainly don't speak for any institution. I, I think, I mean, these people have worked together for nearly 20 years in, in closely controlled situations. Uh, the, the officials, the senior officials and the junior officials know each other very well. And I don't think one should underrate the... Um, the sort of sustain, sustaining power of the, of the, of the um, practice of, of cooperating through the European Competition Network and, and informally and more widely. 
Um, so I would have thought that informal co co cooperation will continue at all in all fora. So with the with the EU, with DG Comp, and with the national competition authorities, where there are these very very close links and strong relationships. Now, from the public point of view, um, I think given the sort of political environment in which we now live in the UK, um, the CMA might find itself under some political pressure not to rush to a formal cooperation uh, agreement with the EU. But I may be wrong there. And I mean, that, that certainly would be one obvious way forward if, if, um, if we go over the cliff on the 31st of December. But I would expect um, bilateral arrangements to be, to be in place also, uh, insofar as they are justified. So both, I think, is the answer. Mm. Mm. And um, uh, Simon Horsington asks, or he observes that there's a kind of um, paradox, not quite a paradox, it, it's um, the EU is planning to dish out astonishingly large numbers of money to cope with the virus. Um, and there's already disputes about that being uh, unfair subsidy to bitter rivals and I think I saw litigation brewing about um, in the airline sector as it often does. Uh, it's, it's difficult to avoid observing that um, competition, state aid, favoritism, national champions, these topics are largely, um, well, there's very little difference between the topics between London and, and Brussels. Um, and I ask, or Simon asks the open-ended question, is that, uh, is that observation any basis for a certain level of optimism that um, there should be a degree of convergence? That's the, that's the question. Do you want me to Anyone? kick off on that? I mean, you yeah. observe yourself that the international pressure over the years has been for convergence in competition doctrine really quite marked since I got involved at you know the public level in the early 2000s I mean there was there was quite diver a lot of divergence then there has been considerable convergence since then I can't see that changing or because there is no need for it to change so uh, and, and as the major initiatives as I said well, you say there's no need but isn't there a political imperative to be seen to be different yes okay so let's have let's have UK competition law for UK competition law's sake I have to say that that, that may carry on for a few months, but it is the ultimate futility in my personal view. <clears throat> yeah, these are strange times. Um, and just since you're unmuted, uh, a question from Bryony. Um, why should, why will, in the future, tech mergers be treated differently from other mergers? Oh, well, that's because they often cover um, market situations where there, there is the, 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 the target company is, does not have an existing market position. So the merger control thresholds, which, which assume a certain um, uh, existence in the market, uh, may not be met. So um, it, man, many big tech mergers uh, involve um, the creators or inventors of a particular uh, technique um, selling out, if you are wishing to sell out to a major company, and most merger control regimes don't don't bite on those. So I think the, the purpose is to get a pre-notification system in so that you can look at it and also try and assess future competition effects as opposed to just two years price price defects, which was, price is not an issue in many big tech markets in any case. So th that's the main purpose of that. Let, let me ask Thomas briefly. Um, I'm posing extravagantly the choice between what's obviously, obviously to this elite band of wise men and women uh, round a screen, uh, what's obviously in that limited sense, a good idea and common sense uh, and the political imperatives. Um, do you see, can we hope for an echo uh, with respect to how Brussels, European Commission, approaches that dichotomy between um, political purity and practical convenience? 
Um, I think there's two, there's two aspects to answer here. First is, um, the, it is always the EU's ambition to see its own rules being um, taken over by third countries and to broaden the footprint of EU law um, globally, if possible, or at least in competition with the United States. So um, I think that's where there is probably a space in future to see uh, more convergence uh, continuing. Um, but the second aspect is and that by now, as I tried to mention at the end of my introduction, there's a, a lot of bad blood between the EU and the UK, at least at institutional level. Um, and that is that, you know, by insisting, uh, by the UK insisting on being a third country, the EU is also insisting uh, on the UK being a third country. Um, and maybe one last remark in this respect, um, if uh, I think on the assumption that we do not get a free trade agreement, then it will take a while before uh, reason will prevail again, before um, approaches can be found. So I expect a couple of months, a year uh, of, of uh, incidents, the disturbance, uh, yeah, uncertainty. But even if we get a, a free trade agreement, there's an aspect to it that we have not discussed, but that's a, it still needs to be ratified. Uh, if it is a simple free trade agreement by the European Parliament, if it's a Canada style one by all parliaments and some regional parliaments uh, in Europe, remember yeah. Wallonia and CETA. And then these competition questions may pop up again. Um, but not in a legal or an enforcement uh, perspective, but rather from a pure political opportunity perspective. Thank you. Um, well, uh, one of the nice features of these webinars, for me particularly, has been uh, to invite um, Sir David Edward to give some helpful um, not always cheerful, but sober assessments uh, at the end. So, David, you are not yet unmuted. No, 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 we haven't. Unmute yourself. Mia, can you help? There we go. I'm, I'm unmuted now. Yep. Well, it's, I think this has been an extraordinarily interesting um, um, session and uh, uh, these web webinars are becoming extremely um, uh, wide ranging. I would, drawing from this discussion, I would uh, draw the following points. First of all, I think we the UK has completely misunderstood so often the nature of the EU treaties and the fact that they are a scheme. They don't consist of a series of um, sectors of law. The whole of EU law is fitted to the scheme and there's a problem in the system adopted by the UK in the Withdrawal Act that somehow EU law will be frozen at a certain point and then adopted or not as the case may be. But EU law moves on and the structure that it is uh, uh, under, under underpinning um, also moves on and so I think there's a serious danger of incoherence in the uh, UK's legal system after, bre after full Brexit. Uh, also I think another point that has come out is that the idea of freedom or escape is illusory. As the Dystas case uh, illustrated all those years ago, 
it is not possible for British companies operating in a market other than a purely domestic market to escape the rain, the, the grasp of EU competition law. Um, the so-called effects doctrine will, I think, apply. And it's also important that British companies operating across the frontiers of the EU, uh, into the EU and across the EU, will be uh, subject to the law of the places where they are operating. And that law will be partly national, but also partly European. So British companies cannot escape that altogether. And one of the uh, essential points to remember is that business hates uncertainty. That is the uh, message constantly being uh, preached to our government, which doesn't seem to take much notice of it, in relation to what is going to happen on the 31st of December of this year. But it does hate uncertainty and it will hate the un legal uncertainty that uh, has been drawn attention to and the, in particular perhaps the uncertainty of the UK not being part of what were called the Brussels Conventions, the various conventions for uh, regulating jurisdiction, deciding, um, defining jurisdiction in and in particular, I think, in the many areas involving family law and children, let alone commercial disputes. Just so that is what I take from this uh, very interesting um, discussion. Can I raise just or interject uh, two points? The first thing is that I think one has to always to be clear as to whether competition law is concerned with regulating markets or managing or controlling markets. And there is a, always the danger that the enthusiastic competition enforcer will seek to manage markets in uh, uh, rather than simply regulate markets and one has to decide whether one wants the competition enforcers to do that and lastly i think we have to consider the uh, in this point has been raised the effect of the covid virus on competition law in this sense that um, In, a, in consequence of the pandemic, businesses have been encouraged to cooperate, to work together in a way that strict application of uh, Article 101 or, or its um, UK equivalent would discourage the, the, the point yes. of the 101 um, uh, prohibition is to prevent um, collusion between businesses but uh, at what point does cooperation between businesses to uh, deal with the uh, COVID uh, problem at what point does that become illegal collusion and can there be there is no provision um, other than 101 uh, three, there is no there is no provision for permission to collude. Um, the and the furthermore, there is obviously a danger of the creation of dominant positions if a vaccine is uh, found. Whoever has the vaccine will 
perhaps be in a dominant position on the market and ditto in the supply of uh, protective equipment and so on. So it seems to me that there, there are ways in which the um, effect of the cooperation and developments or in response to the virus may cut across the strict application of 101 and 102 and ditto in the field of state aids. Uh, the member states have been lavishly um, expending money in support of businesses. Now, this is nothing to do with the particular dispute that is going on between UK and the EU at the moment about um, uh, state aids, but state aids have been being dis uh, distributed lavishly and without any overall control. When is that to stop? How is it to be assessed? That is a question for uh, competition lawyers and it may be that um, individual businesses find themselves, uh, and you've illustrated this in the case of the airline industry, they say this isn't fair the way money is being distributed. So those are the, my takeaways from this, but it's been extremely interesting for me and I'm sure for others. Well, many, many thanks, David. Uh, I, I observe um, most practicing lawyers in Brussels spent in their youthful days um, many hours on the subject of export bans. And there, uh, during the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, no matter how plausible, no matter how economically rational your argument was, yes, it might theoretically hinder trade between member states, but for all these very good reasons, it was justifiable. Um, those arguments always uh, perished. Um, so someone said in the course of this discussion today, uh, do we go for religion or do we go for uh, consumer benefit? And there will, I, I predict, echoing what David Edwards was just saying about the um, gigantic sums being expended by the state in the context of or the states in the context of the COVID crisis. Uh, there's going to come somehow, sometime, a, a debate about um, do we go for principle or we do, do we go for um, what someone is going to call common sense uh, or pragmatism. And what someone else is going to say uh, is um, deplorable um, departure from basic principles. Well, um, we are just at quarter past. Um, I think this has been terribly, terribly interesting. I'm really grateful to our four speakers and to our, um, uh, our um, grey eminence, uh, David Edward, really interesting. It's been recorded and the slides are going to be available and I look forward to seeing you all at one of our next uh, seminars on uh, litigation in a time of COVID crisis, online litigation, on the future of Ireland and on the easy question of Brexit, where are we now? Um, those uh, invitations will be coming out. Thank you very much indeed and uh, let's get on with earning a living today. Thank you very much for your presence. Bye-bye.